Welcome to episode 8 of our series Back to Basics Business Technology Platform. Until now we have spoken about data storage, data movements, data quality, data lakes, data warehouses, orchestration. We talked about the platforms in the previous episode. Today we are going to look at how to deploy all of these elements, all these components in a cloud environment. Today we're going to talk about hyperscalers. In our previous episode, we emphasized the importance of platforms and the rise of cloud architecture. Short reminder, cloud computing is the delivery of computing services, including servers, storage, databases, networking, software, analytics, and intelligence over the internet or the cloud to offer faster innovation, flexible resources, and economies of scale. In this definition, a keyword is service. This raises two major questions. What is delivered and what is the guarantee associated with the service? Introducing cloud computing in an architecture is altering the traditional dual customer provider relationship. Having in the middle the cloud computing provider may mean that some advanced capabilities of software or hardware are not available anymore as they require advanced knowledge of the product a cloud team is not able or willing to provide. Usually in the cloud, products are delivered pre-configured, simulated to t-shirt size, and very low flexibility is possible to use unforeseen capabilities. It is therefore important to understand the differences between the on-premises and the cloud versions. Another critical aspect is security as resources and data are relocated from proprietary data centers and many sensitive information can pass through the internet. Licensing model is also often different. Because of the flexibility induced by the hardware or software platforms, it will be more often based on resource consumption, such as usage of cores or network, instead of resource allocation, that would mean number of cores, throughput of network. When we consider the different components stacked to deploy an application, we can see three main areas of technologies. The hardware, the software needed to operate it, and the software needed to run the application. The hardware layer is made of servers, CPU, cores, RAM, etc. Storage, physical disk, SAN, NAS, etc. And the network, network cards, routers, hubs, etc. All these components are used to ensure enough performance and flexible scalability through virtualization. Virtualization refers to the act of creating a virtual rather than actual version of something, including virtual computer hardware platforms, storage devices, and computer network resources. Performance and high availability are some of the main concerns in this layer. The OS layer provides everything you need to operate the infrastructure, the operating system itself. Most popular today is Linux or Windows. But also the middleware. Middleware is the computer software that provides services to software applications beyond those available from the operating system. It can be described as software glue. Middleware makes it easier for software developers to implement communication and input-output so they can focus on the specific purpose of their application. Finally, the runtime is a set of software that will help ensuring high availability, disaster recovery, performance monitoring and other activities helping compliance to the service level agreement. Finally, the application layer is made of program or group of programs designed for end users. This contrasts with system software, which is mainly involved with running the computer. Applications may be bundled with the computer and its system software or published separately and may be coded as proprietary open source or university projects. Applications commonly interact with data, such as those managed by RDBMSs process them and provide interface with the users. If we compare the on-premises architecture, where all the layers are managed internally by the organization 
and the cloud architecture will realize it is all about discussing with a third party about the kind of service he can provide. Today, there are three main kind of services a cloud provider proposes, and they are mimicking the layered stack we've just explained. Infrastructure as a service, or YAS, are online services that provide high-level APIs or application programming interfaces used to dereference various low-level details of underlying network infrastructure like physical computing resources, location, data partitioning, scaling, security, backup, and others. Typically, YAS involves the use of a cloud orchestration technology. This manages the creation of a virtual machine and decides on which hypervisor, meaning physical host, to start it, enables virtual machines migration, features between hosts, allocates storage volumes and attaches them to virtual machines, keeping track of usage information for billing and lots more. Platform as a service, PaaS, or Application Platform as a service, APaaS, or platform-based service is a category of cloud computing services that provides a platform allowing customers to develop, run, and manage applications without the complexity of building and maintaining the infrastructure typically associated with developing and launching an application. In a pass, the consumer controls software development with minimal configuration options, and the provider provides the networks, servers, storage, operating systems, database and other services to host the consumer's application. Software as a service, SaaS, is a software licensing and delivery model in which software is licensed on a subscription basis and is centrally hosted. SaaS applications are also known as web-based software, on-demand software or hosted software. SaaS applications are typically accessed by user using a thin client, meaning a web browser. SaaS has become a common delivery model for many business applications, including ERP, so enterprise resource planning, CRM, customer relationship management, HRM, human resource management, and others. SaaS has been incorporated into the strategy of nearly all leading enterprise software companies. Those days, EAS PaaS, SaaS, so infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, are not the only terms used in the as a service family. More specialist area can be offered as a service, like desktop as a service, or managed software as a service, or mobile backend as a service, or data center as a service, or information technology management as a service, or business process as a service, finance as a service and many others. The point here is that it is all about finding a partner to provide services and define together how those services can be delivered. It is therefore critical to understand the service level agreement, SLA, associated with the service. A service level agreement, SLA, is a commitment between a service provider and a client. Particular aspects of the service, such as quality, availability, responsibilities, are agreed between the service provider and the service user. The most common component of an SLA is that the services should be provided to the customer as agreed upon in the contract. As an example, internet service providers and telcos will commonly include service level agreements with the terms of their contract with customers to define the levels of service being sold in plain language terms. In this case, the SLA will typically have a technical definition in mean time between failures, so MTBF, or mean time to repair, or mean time to recovery, so MTTR, identifying which party is responsible for reporting faults or paying fees, responsibility for various data rates, volume, throughput, or similar measurable details. SLA commonly include many components, from a definition of services to the termination of agreement. To ensure that SLAs are consistently met, these agreements are often designed with specific lines of demarcation and the parties involved are required to meet regularly to create an open forum for communication. 
Rewards and penalties applying to the provider are often specified. Most SLAs also leave room for periodic, most of the time annual, review to make changes. Service level agreements are also defined at different levels. We see the customer-based SLA, which is an agreement with the individual customer group covering all the services they use. Or a service-based SLA, it's an agreement for all customers using the services being delivered by the service provider. And finally, corporate level SLA, covering all the generic service level management issues appropriate to every customer throughout the organization. These service level management are often abbreviated as SLM. The issues are likely to be less volatile and so updates or SLA reviews are less frequently required. In the context of a cloud architecture, the term hyperscaler is often mentioned. In computing, hyperscale is the ability of an architecture to scale appropriately as increased demand is added to the system. Hyperscale computing is necessary in order to build a robust and scalable cloud, big data or distributed storage system and is often associated with the infrastructure required to run large distributed sites such as Google, Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft or Amazon. Some of those companies do not only build these infrastructures for themselves, but also propose their customers to use part of it. In this episode, we will focus on the three main hyperscalers recognized by analysts on the market. That is Amazon with Amazon Web Services or AWS, Google with Google Cloud Platform or GCP, and Microsoft with Azure. This does not limit the list of hyperscalers, but it might be good to explain the differences in strategy and focus. Amazon's biggest strengths is its dominance in the public cloud market. In its magic quadrant for cloud infrastructure as a service worldwide, Gartner noted, quote, AWS has been the market share leader in cloud YAS for over 10 years. Part of the reason for its popularity is undoubtedly the massive scope of its operations. AWS has a huge and growing array of available services, as well as the most comprehensive network of data centers worldwide. The Gartner report summed it up, saying, quote, AWS is the most mature enterprise-ready software with the deepest capabilities for governing a large number of users and resources. Amazon's big weakness relates to cost. Many enterprises find it difficult to understand the company's cost structure and to manage those costs effectively when running a high volume of workload on the service. In general, however, these cons are more than outweighed by Amazon's strengths and organizations of all sizes continue to use AWS for a wide variety of workloads. Microsoft came late to the cloud market, but gave itself a jumpstart by essentially taking its on-premises software, such as Windows Server, Office, SQL Server, SharePoint, Dynamics, Active Directory, .NET and others, and repurposing it for the cloud. A big reason for Azure's success is that so many enterprises deploy Windows and other Microsoft software. Because Azure is tightly integrated with these other applications, enterprises that use a lot of Microsoft software often find that it makes sense to use Azure for themselves. This builds loyalty for existing Microsoft customers. Also, if you are already an existing Microsoft Enterprise customer, expect significant discounts of services contracts. On the con side, Gartner finds fault with some of the platform's imperfections. Quote, While Microsoft Azure is an enterprise-ready platform, Gartner clients report that the service experience feels less enterprise-ready than they expected, given Microsoft's long history as an enterprise vendor. Customers cite issues with technical support, documentation, training, and breadth of the ISV partner ecosystem. 
Finally, Google. Google has a strong offering in containers since Google developed the Kubernetes standard that AWS and Azure offer now. GCP specializes in high compute offerings like big data analytics and machine learning. It also offers considerable scale and load balancing. Google knows data centers and fast response time. On the downside, Google is a distant third in market share, perhaps because it does not offer as many different services and features as AWS and Azure. It also doesn't have as many global data centers as AWS or Azure, although it is quickly expanding. Gartner said that its client typically choose GCP as a secondary provider rather than a strategic provider, though GCP is increasingly chosen as a strategic alternative to AWS by customers whose businesses compete with Amazon and that are more open source centric or DevOps centric and thus are less well aligned to Microsoft Azure. Now that we know all about the hyperscalers, all about the movements, the quality, the ways of storing data, the data quality, the data warehouses, the data lakes, all of these different components, how do they work together? How do they provide value to an enterprise? This is what we are going to see in the next episode. See you soon.